Good afternoon and welcome to another PCA Live. This is Scott Pierce, the Executive Director of the Premium Cigar Association. Thank you everybody for joining this afternoon. We got a special lineup this afternoon with our good friend and supporter, Rocky Patel. Uh, and Joshua Haberski, our Head of Federal Affairs, is gonna join us here in just a second. We're gonna be covering a little bit about our government affairs actions and kind of what's going on there. But also we wanna get Rocky's insights in terms of what's going on uh, amidst COVID-19 how he's kind of reacting as far as the manufacturer components, also with Burn by Rocky Patel, uh, how he sees that for retailers as well. So we're interested to get his insights on these as well. So I'm gonna bring up Josh here, and I'm gonna bring up Rocky. Apologize for the airplane flying overhead. I didn't realize airlines were still flying, so hopefully you can't hear that coming through. Josh, Rocky, guys, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. How are you guys doing? Good, as well as we could be. Good to be with you. Hopefully everyone's safe out there and taking care of themselves. Thanks, Brock and Scott. Very excited to, to join uh, you guys and talk a little bit about what's going on and, and how we're getting through it. Great. Thank you. Uh, and because we're live, uh, for everybody who's joining us, please feel free to add comments and ask questions as we're going. We'll, we'll get to them when we can. And so uh, without further ado, I'd like to just turn this over to Josh. You want to kick us off and, and kind of introduce some of the topics we're talking about and, and go with some questions. For sure. Well, obviously, Rocky, we're, we're honored to have you. You're very involved um, on multiple different fronts in the premium cigar industry and one of the foremost manufacturers, uh, as well as leaders in the uh, fight for our rights as cigar enthusiasts. Um, they, they always say, you don't need any introduction, but I'm going to phrase this question a little bit else for those that are, are watching from our Capitol Hill audience and consumers. If you had to pick an intro song, like a, a baseball walk-up song, what song would you pick? Because that tells a lot about your personality. Me, myself, what song yeah. would I pick? Born to Run. By Bruce Born to Run, Bruce Springsteen. Good choice. I, I, I was thinking about this because I had to answer the question too. I'm a big fan of the UFC. So Conor McGregor's walkout song, uh, which is a remix of Foggy Dew and Hypnotize by uh, the Notorious B.I.G. So that would be my 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 walk-up song. But I think that uh, is emblematic. But so how my generation doesn't know that song. No. Oh man. Well, Neither does I'm mine, Rocky. Song, Neither does song mine. That starts with the word Notorious is not one that I'll, I'll do. <laughs> We'll have to send you a CD, uh, a CD or a, 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 you know, a record of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know but, what uh, I think of hip hop. So, uh, how how are you personally getting through the coronavirus? I see a lot of folks, you know, taking the time, fitness, cooking, enjoying different cigars. You know, you can't travel. Obviously, your schedule uh, during normal times is flight to flight to flight. So, how are you getting through this uh, personally? Well, as you can see, I haven't shaved. I got my eyeglasses on. Uh, I actually got a haircut for this very famous television show that we're on right now. Um, you know, I actually kind of did one myself, motivated to haircuts. And uh, now we've been under strict quarantine, pretty much taking care of ourselves. Uh, it's been very difficult, especially for myself, who's on the go, 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 used to uh, chasing airports and TCA lines and uh, TSA lines. but. You know, it's all, I, I don't mind the, the non-traveling. Trust me, there's, I'm really enjoying this. But I'm not enjoying uh, to see how the economy is suffering, how people are suffering, the health is suffering. That's the most foremost, the most important thing, right? And uh, so it's it's been an introspective time, spending a lot of time cooking, uh, spending a lot of time working out, spending a lot of time just reaching out to friends, reaching out to the industry, um, talk to people, keep them motivated, keep them excited, give them hope. Uh, you know, we're, obviously it's been a very difficult situation with 3,000 some people in Honduras and Nicaragua. Uh, you know, we're trying to keep them on payroll and employed, uh, trying to negotiate with the labor groups and the government uh, about, you know, possibly allowing them to come back to work under very strict safeguards. We truly believe that they would be safer in the factory uh, than they would be at work. I talked to Corey from Oliva. Um, you know, they've, they've done the same thing as many of us. We've provided food for the employees for up to a month in storage. We've got some really strict health standards that uh, we've imposed. Right now, the factories are absolutely shut down. 
Um, and you know, the, the goal is that if and when the government gives us permission to reopen, not only social distancing, but you know, uh, everything to, to, that deals with cleanliness and anything that is touched, I mean, that involves gloves, that involves masks, acquiring this equipment, it's not easy to get. So uh, we're working on, uh, on accumulating all these things uh, so that we have a safe work, workplace. That's the most important thing. So that's what's going on down in Honduras and Nicaragua. Uh, here, you know, we're trying to come up with a program of how we can support the brick and mortar retailers once they open. So we're formulating and doing a lot of think tanking um, about what we can do to support this industry, especially the brick and mortar stores uh, for the long haul here. It's going to be a very difficult situation in the short term. And uh, I, I wish people keep their hopes up. Uh, we are one family. Uh, we depend on each other all the way from the manufacturing uh, to the consumer and including the brick and mortar store. So, uh, you know, we're cognizant of that and uh, we're working hard to come in, coming up with a plan uh, to work. But I know it's a difficult situation. Uh, many, most of them are closed. We, we see that in our orders. Some of them with the websites are succeeding. Um, people that are, uh, you know, basically allowing curbside pickup and stuff. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a minor amount to make up for the lost sales. So, uh, you know, hopefully with your lobbying, Josh, and uh, with the lobbying of uh, Mike and other people that we have, some of the tools that we have with Congress to, to take care of the small business brick and mortar uh, community. Uh, hopefully there's some sort of relief there, a package there. Uh, hopefully all the manufacturers get together and come up with uh, a plan that can help support the brick and mortars because uh, brick mortars because uh, we believe that they're truly vital uh, to this industry. Absolutely, and we did a webinar yesterday, uh, PCA that Scott and I were on, talking a little bit about some of the government programs that are available uh, to folks. You know, the payment protection program uh, being one that you know brick and mortar retailers can apply for. We've been putting out almost daily updates on that so that folks can get the funds to con so that they can continue uh, to support their payroll and their businesses. Uh, right now, we're working on phase four of those negotiations in Congress to expand that program by $250 uh, billion and also make it more uh, streamlined. Obviously, that this is a huge hit to our entire economy, and you have a, a great demand for these resources and government programs at the local, state, and federal level. So we're doing a lot of um, you know outreach on that front, um, trying to get those resources on the manufacturing front, looking at tax deferment. Um, one of the things that we found to be interesting is that any um, production that's overseas, most of these benefits don't help businesses that operate in the United States if production is elsewhere. Uh, so we're working with customs and, and border, uh, border control, uh, as well as TTB and some other agencies to get some tax deferment relief on that. Um, other industries like the liquor industry are, are in a similar boat with that where it's uh, difficult to get those uh, resources uh, but we're expecting to get some relief there in, in the uh, short term. And I know that some of our, our retailers have already gotten uh, checks from the payment uh, payroll protection program, something that Senator Rubio uh, was in, instrumental on. Uh, but we're really working to expand that and get get every uh, the industry so that we can have a robust recovery. But as you mentioned, it takes the industry and manufacturers like it, such as yourself to really uh, step up and come up with those programs. So we really appreciate that. On the, um, you know, the lounge side of things and, and the businesses that you have, you also have several lounges, Berm. What are you doing from that that perspective, the retail perspective? Well, I mean, yeah, so just let me finish. So, you know, from the manufacturer's perspective, I mean, many of us have a pretty big, a big, pretty big sales force. I mean, we've got about 22 people that are basically sitting at home. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's quite a big payroll. Uh, that we have to deal with and you know with not having the opportunity to sell cigars through our brick and mortar partners and and ob obviously you know it's going to hurt the industry so uh, we have to make some changes and accommodations on you know uh, how we move forward so there's there's a lot of powwow meetings going on as to you know what the game plan is moving forward obviously uh, the burn which is more of a cigar bar uh, 
Uh, they've all been closed for a while. At the same time, we still have rent payments of about a quarter million uh, that we need to make over the next couple months. I think, you know, uh, one of the most important things, I think, Josh, that we can lobby Congress on is that, uh, you know, all the brick and mortar stores and, um, you know, myself included in, in a way, uh, we have these rent obligations that are not going away. And it seems to me these landlords have been quite heavy handed during this tough time. Um, I was talking to Jeff Borshowitz, a Corona cigar company, uh, as several other retailers who reached out to their landlords and the landlords are absolutely uh, not working. Uh, yeah, sure, they'll, they'll defer your rent for 30 days, but that really does you no good when you have zero income coming in because you have the rent the next month or the month after and the month after that. So uh, they really need to, the Congress needs to take a hard look at uh, some of these rent obligations and work with the banks who have the notes to these landlords because I think uh, that's going to be the most difficult challenge facing people moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that Scott, um, you know, you and, and Glenn Loop are going to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff that we're, we're working on uh, tomorrow. But, you know, Rocky, you've been in this industry for 25 years. You know, what are some of the high points and low points that you've experienced as someone active in the legal, you know, litigation, regulatory, as well as legislative push? And, you know, what are some lessons learned that, you know, we can take into this fight today? Well, I mean, the lowest point was when I was in Washington, D.C., working on S-CHIP. And this is almost a decade ago now, I think. Yeah, it's been so long. And I went there to see how inactive our industry was and how unorganized we were between the, the retail branch, the manufacturing branch, the consumer branch. Uh, we really didn't have a voice in Washington. And we were being steamrolled by big tobacco. And uh, it was unfortunate. And, you know, I've always said this, and I've gone on record saying this, um, that we could have been exempt from s -chip or at least ended up with 12 and a half cents instead of the 41 cents we pay now. Uh, yes, it was proposed to be $3, but again, we got steamrolled and it's a long story. I don't want to get into it. But having said that, that was a learning opportunity for all of us to get organized. And I think, you know, we've made our voice heard now uh, with regards to protecting this artisan cottage industry in D.C., uh, with, especially in light of the FDA regulations, certainly many tax bills and other bills out there. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest challenge we have is that the TTB tax code uh, really has a broad definition of what a premium cigar is. There's no difference between these artisan products and a blunt wrapper, a swisher sweet. They all qualify under the TTB tax code as a premium cigar. So that's one challenge that we need to overcome. Uh, certainly the headways we've made with all the lobbying efforts in Congress uh, over the several years, even though we haven't had a particular bill passed, the message has has really uh, been, uh, you know, been loud and clear, uh, not only to the administration, but uh, to many agencies uh, in Washington, D.C. And I think we've made a lot of headway through that. And, you know, I think the ruling that we got with Judge Maida on the warnings case uh, was very, very strong and relevant. Um, it was very clear uh, that, you know, we needed to protect the artisan quality of these boxes with all the heritage and the family lifestyle and the tobaccos and the limited tobaccos and the vintages. And that was an infringement on freedom of speech. But then he furthermore went on to say that the, uh, the, that the FDA had not provided us any scientific evidence or data uh, that showed that the language, the strong language, on these warning stickers that express that they cause cancer and they're, uh, you know, cause all this harm and uh, disease. Uh, he just flat out said that there's no evidence to show any relevance uh, that there's a significant health imp impact on the industry to violate uh, them and, and make them put these warning stickers. So I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm cautiously optimistic. So that was a good ruling. We, we feel very strongly and cautiously optimistic that these um, arbitrary, egregious, and overreaching uh, regulations from the FDA concerning substantial equivalence and constituent testing, um, that we can have a, a victory in court. I know there's oral arguments on April 23rd uh, in front of Judge Maida that might get postponed because of the virus a little bit, but we, we feel confident that we have a pretty strong argument there. Um, I think the uh, 
lobbying and the outreach between uh, PCA and uh, CRA and many manufacturers, including yourself, Josh, and, uh, and others. Many other retailers have been in those meetings uh, with the White House now that we're fully engaged. They understand the issue. They understand the urgency of our issue. They understand how many people, uh, how many mom and pop brick and mortar stores uh, would really um, be affected by this regulation. They, they understand how many manufacturers would be affected and they certainly understand the number of employees in Honduras, Nicaragua, and Dominican uh, that would be affected. And so the administration was working hard. They set up a task force uh, to work on this issue. We engaged with them, met with them many, many times, including the vice president's office and senior cabinet members. And just when we were getting somewhere, the, the virus hit. So it, it's been put on the back burner, but we're hopeful that once once this all passes, that we'll be back at the table again. And it's an important issue that they understand. So, you know, the, the, uh, that will be the high point. Once we can get the FDA monkey of our back, that will be our that will be the high point in my life when we can really go back to what we do best, which is, uh, you know, go back to making good cigars, work on, you know, marketing, work on the day to day activities, which we've completely neglected. I know I have for the last five to six years. And it, it's it's sad to see when you're just involved in red tape and, and spending over 50 percent of your time dealing with that. It makes no sense. Why? What desire would anybody have to be? Uh, in business or be an entrepreneur. It, it just like it puts a bad taste in your mouth. And I feel like we've been eating this poison pill for five years and it's time for all of this to go away. And hopefully, uh, you know, the, the silver lining in all this is that we've, we've gone through so much stress now and we will be going through stress for the next six months at least uh, that any agency and any government body would realize that the worst thing we want to do to our citizens is cause them more pain and cause them more grief uh, and, 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 and have them go through this overreaching regulation and, and, and take their jobs and, and, and take their careers away. So uh, hopefully there's a silver lining there. And, uh, you know, that's what we got to work on. So I, can I just ask a real quick question here in relevance to kind of what's going on? Came up last night in, in, a, in another panel that I was involved with. But right now we see across all industries, it's uncertainty. And we see the struggles with which all businesses have in dealing with an uncertain environment. Is there a way in which we can potentially use that to message a little bit more saying, look, you've provided us uncertainty for so many years and we can see the negative impacts that uncertainty is having across the board right now across the economies. Is, is that something to be able to tailor as far as our message now going forward a little bit is, You've been providing this artificially to us for some time now, regardless of the pandemic. But now we can actually equate that to what others are going through and we can feel the real impacts about people not being able to proceed, progress, reinvest back in their businesses because of the uncertainty, let alone just keeping their stores open. Rocky, Josh, do you guys see that as a way in which we can kind of tailor some more messaging in that regard of saying, look, you guys provide us all of these different variables. We have no idea what's going on. How do you expect business to operate? And now we have real world examples about what happens to other industries when the same thing happens. Uh, we're, well, we're going to have to continue to fight, you know, no matter what's going on. I think the coronavirus, you know, as, as Rocky correctly pointed out, we had to adapt and change. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're providing the information to the entire industry, retailers, manufacturers, consumers of what's going on. But, you know, we can't lay back and we have to continue that outreach. So, you know, we're, you know, in constant contact with HHS, the FDA, working on issues that were pre-coronavirus and then also ones that are going as a result of the coronavirus. We did a survey and hundreds of retailers responded to this where, uh, you know, th they sent information of how they're adapting their businesses to try to stay afloat. Um, and governments uh, across the country are still taking negative action towards the premium cigar industry where, you know, PCA and CRA are fighting. Perfect example, Virginia. They want to increase taxes through the governor's budget by 100% on premium cigars. So that's uh, something that we're going to continue to fight through this pandemic. New York, similar. 
uh, another tax increase in the in the budget there. So, you know, I think that we have to add on a, a new issue set and really devote our time in a multitude of different ways, you know, providing that information. We've also, also had to establish the constituent services angle. I'm on the phone with 30 to 40 retailers every week, walking them through, you know, loan application, grants, programs uh, of how to become essential businesses, things like that in response. And then we're also communicating what is the overall impact on the premium cigar industry of the coronavirus? How are manufacturers being um, you know, affected? How are retailers being affected? And that's a talking point to, um, you know, all of these government bodies. Um, you know, Rocky mentioned, you know, prior to the coronavirus, we were making a lot of headway. I think a, a perfect example of that is in January, where the FDA themselves acknowledged that premium cigars are the lowest enforcement uh, priority. We need to take that that commentary and that guidance that they provided, and we need a lasting solution. If we get this four month uh, delay or 120 delay on substantial equivalence as a result of the coronavirus, that's helpful, but that's not a long standing relief that will be in place. And we need to take that across the finish line. We're at yeah, the, we're at the, right now, the, the administration has been very clear. We don't need a band aid. We need a full time fix. And that means exemption. And, and we, we and that's why, you know, when we started talking regulation light with, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention the names of the people at the White House that we talked to. And we were very clear that regulation light doesn't help because the next administration comes in and, and, and just, uh, you know, uh, just unravels everything. And we can't live this uncertain life that we live. And to your point, Scott, that was a great question that you asked. You know, now that this has affected everybody else, it's easy to sit in a glass house and throw stones. And now people realize, you know, you can't be all high and mighty and say, OK, well, I don't like that. And I don't like how this person behaves. And, I, you know, I don't like that habit. And, uh, you know, I want people to not enjoy that luxury lifestyle product. And uh, so guess what? You know, it, now it's affecting everybody and they know what it feels like. And at the end of the day, all these health groups, Tobacco Free Kids, American Lung Association, American Cancer Association, World Health Organization, you know, they need to get back to what they're supposed to do. And, you know work on research, work on cures, make ventilators, get stock, by, do it instead of just sitting there lobbying and lobbying and lobbying and beating down people uh, just to, to, to push your agenda. And that goes to Bloomberg and Mike Bloomberg and all those other cronies out there. So, you know, work on what's best for the world, work on what's good for society. Don't take your individual views. Uh, you know, this is a legal product. We have zero you access issues. Uh, we've got all the evidence to show that there's no relevant health impact. You know, leave us alone. Let us do your thing. If you don't like it, go enjoy something else. Go enjoy your Fritos and Coca-Cola. Leave us alone. Uh, so hopefully this message is going to resonate. You know, we know what we have to do, Josh, in Washington, D.C. We still have to work closely with the White House. That's going to be a, a, a saving grace. And, and hopefully the courts will also be a saving grace. So we're, we're definitely stepping on the gas and we're not going to take our pedal off the metal there. Absolutely. How, how do you think that, you know, in the recovery and the response to the coronavirus, you talked about this in, in one of your answers. How do you think that retailers and manufacturers can work together along with the associations, along with, you know, Cigar Rights of America, PCA? How can we, you know, once this settles and all the travel restrictions are, are, are um, out of place, how, how do we respond as an industry, regardless of what government is doing? I think what needs to happen is once people get their house in order, and ultimately it's going to take some time, but people are going to focus on getting their individual house in order. And absolutely they must. And we should work as a team to help each other to do that, whatever it takes. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, and that's what we're working on now is uh, we, we sit in a, in our little meetings uh, that we have but because there's nothing else going on to think about what is the game plan moving forward once uh, this virus kind of uh, the pandemic starts, you know, uh, just kind of going away. And, and, and so I think that what, what comes out of this is that we all need to work together for one common cause and everyone needs to understand that moving forward, 
part of the cost of doing business, just in any industry, there is a cost for advocacy and litigation. Because at the end of the day, we have these forces that are never going to let go. Okay. The first thing that's going to happen once this pandemic is over and people get their house in order, the government's going to look for more taxes. This money that's being given away, okay, this deficit has to be paid somehow. The states are going to need the money. Again, they're going to go to tobacco products and we're going to get lumped in with all the other evil tobacco products. While we're different and we're separate, we still get lumped in because there's always somebody at the last minute who says, well, what about cigars? Why are they getting away? And of course, the cigarette companies, they always want to point the finger at somebody else instead of take the blame for their products. And so we're going to have these issues and they're going to be pressing. So it's important for everybody. I don't know if we're going to have a trade show this year, but whenever we have the next trade show, it's important that you attend. The financial resources that are involved in this battle, they protect everybody. They protect every mom and pop store, every brick and mortar store. They protect every manufacturer, small, medium, or big. They, you know, they, they protect the entire industry. And in order to do that, we need revenue. And the revenue comes from all sources. It comes from the retail, the retailers being involved. It comes from all the manufacturers participating, being involved. It comes from all the growers being involved. It comes from people that make the boxes, the bad banner. Everybody that's involved in this industry needs to participate and be fair and give their fair share. And that's been the problem. You got 10 to 15% of the industry carrying the weight for the other 85%. And that's just not fair. And it's selfish. And, you know, if you want to survive and, and really are proud of the industry that you participate in and proud of this heritage and this artisan cottage industry, well, you need to participate and you need to participate with your fair share. And that's not only in money, it's in time, it's in attending the shows, it's being present, it's being present for everything involved. Every little thing adds up and that's that allows our, our industry to move forward. And, and we're Otherwise, really do something else. Go just get out of it and go do something else. Do something else you enjoy. But if you really intend to stay in this industry, well then get involved and participate. There is no free ride and there shouldn't be one. It's not fair. Yeah, and, and and that's you know, it's a testament to how much you've done for the industry. I think it was, you know, what, three weeks in a row or or maybe one week in between where you were in Washington, DC, uh, on your on your own dime working with us to get that. Uh, message heard. And initially, we were supposed to do this interview uh, for a live event, but we had too many people that were interested in hearing about what was going on that we didn't have enough space there at the, the townhouse. So over 100 and some congressional staff, administration uh, officials that are, you know, listening in today, you know, how can they be helpful um, you know, from the inside in helping protect our industry. If they're a cigar enthusiast that, you know, works in, in the federal government. Well, I mean, listen, every bit counts and, 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 and I'm doing it for selfish reasons. I mean, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about what could happen to the future of the industry, the hard work we we put in to build the company. And, and I see the writing on the wall. I've seen a long time ago. Uh, you know, I've been beating that drum for a long time. It took a long time for people to wake up. Uh, you know, I've been saying this for over a decade that we need to get involved, that the enemies that we have out there are well capitalized. They're very strong. They're very powerful. Uh, they're, they're sending out wrong messages um, and, and, and we're not combating it. Right. So we're going to be steamrolled. And then we also have our competitors in big tobacco. That would like to see everybody gone and they'd be the lone man standing so these are the battles we face so you know if we have people that are uh you know that have relationships in congress come to washington dc you know come to come to the pca house get involved in walking the hallways uh get involved in telling your story uh every congressman every senator wants to hear from the littlest constituent that they have. They care about every little brick and mortar store and they don't want them going out of business. So you need to participate and get involved in the meetings. You need to come to the trade show, okay? A significant amount of the capital that's required to lobby and fight these battles, much of it comes from the attendance at the trade show. Uh, if you're a manufacturer, you know, small, medium or large, you know, you need to absolutely get involved, whether it's with Cigar Rights of America, or, or uh, you know, you, 
all the financial help works and helps. And as a consumer, you know, uh, Cigar Rights of America, CigarRights.org, you know, please get involved. Your participation is involved. Uh, you know, all the money that we raise from your 20 or $25 donation goes towards fighting. I mean, just think about it. We spent $6 million in a year and a half battling two issues right now, substantial equivalence and the warning sticker issue. Okay, six and a half million dollars. Okay, didn't fall off the tree. We spent another three to four million dollars on lobbyists. And so you're looking at over ten million dollars spent directly to protect this industry because we would have been steamrolled by the FDA. And uh, for those of you that don't understand how burdensome and overreaching these regulations are, I know for a company like mine, it would cost me $60 million just to go through these constituent chemical testing and substantial equivalence filings. Uh, most brick and mortar stores, uh, you know, uh, it would be hard to stay in business because the, the pipeline of new products and available products would dry up. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not just frugal. We're not doing this because uh, for egotistic reasons. We, we're doing this because we truly believe this is the way to save the future of our industry. And, and so and these costs are uh, they're not going away anytime soon. Now, hopefully, if we get this victory once and for all against the FDA, you know, that big litigation bill goes away. But think about this. You know, we have so many states enacting. Uh, on a weekly, sometimes monthly basis, uh, all kinds of uh, ridiculous regulations. You know, uh, I've talked to many of the folks at PCA, uh, our good friend that she runs a, the state uh, uh, affairs for us. You know, there, there's anti-smoking regulation. There's taxation. Right now, you just had a bill introduced in Virginia with a 100% yeah. increase. Okay. Uh, now we've got these ridiculous overreaching laws uh, where... If there's a characterizing flavor, which means that if you can describe a cigar as having caramel, coffee, and espresso, it can't be sold. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sure that was not the intention, but that's how the law reads. And so what happens is, when the, once these once these archaic laws are written, then the health groups go in and try to get them enforced in the courts. And all our products would not be allowed to be sold in about eight or nine states right now. So these are things that you need to be in touch with. Uh, if you're not involved and everybody else is fighting the battle for you, it can't be done. I mean, we need an army of participation. It just can't be constantly be done by 10 or 15 percent of the people in the industry. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is kind of what you were that, that last point, I think, is is so important to, to realize is that we've got to be able to activate our what I consistently refer to as our tripod. Right. Is that we've got manufacturers, we've got retailers and we need consumers. We need to activate as many, if not all, in our entire constituency groups at all levels in order to attack this, because it is a smaller industry. It's a niche industry uh, in terms of, of both manufacturers, retailers, as well as consumers. It takes all of us in order to, to try to match even just a little bit some of the intensity that comes on the other side of it. And we had one of our state representatives post a comment here, and I just want to echo that to Rocky's point. So much of what ends up happening at the federal level, it begins in a local municipality and then starts to percolate up. And that's why we continue to fight the battle so much. We had victories in Kentucky. We're trying to get another one in Virginia uh, when they're trying to sneak stuff in again in New York. We're having battles all over the country at the local levels because if we can quash them down there and by quash them, it's not like we're trying to make them go away for, for reasons that are only ours. We're, we're making very strong cases backed by data and backed by science. We know tax caps work to, uh, it works in order to bring in more revenues for the states. We know the health, obviously, implications as far as premium cigars are concerned, meaning those health implications, there are none. And so on our local level, please get involved with PCA at that local level, because the more we can get onto the state capitals, the, the relationships with the local representatives there through retail stores and the consumers and all of the employees at those stores in all of the districts across this country means then that our voices start to have an exponential result. And that gives us ammunition at both the federal, at the state level, but ultimately the federal level as well. Yeah, I mean, just simply joining your state association uh, makes a lot of sense, right? If you if you can't get a law involved in the state association, uh, you know, it, it's shocking to me that in many states where there's about 120 retailers, there's six people or eight people, maximum 10 in the state association. Now, how would you like it if this industry had 10 retailers left, 10 big retailers, that includes the internet sites and the uh, mail order, 
and you had about eight to 10 manufacturers. That wouldn't be healthy for any industry. And, and that's where you're going to drive things to. If you don't participate at the local level in your state association where these things rise on a weekly and monthly basis and get involved in fighting these things, we're not going to be able to fend them off. Ultimately, it'll be a losing battle. Okay, it's going to be a Band-Aid. So you got to get involved at that level. you got to get involved with Rachel from PCA. you got to get involved with Josh and, and Scott and everybody else. So join your local state association. See what's coming up. Get together lobby in the state, walk the halls, you'll be shocked at the difference you'll make once you get your name known and, you're, and, and you get your message uh, across to, to the local people. Yeah, because a lot of these groups that are proposing some of these archaic things, you know, they have no opposition, and that's why it gets passed. But when you're actually there uh, talking about your business and the impact it has on the business and why it makes no sense, well, then people kind of go, well, I'm not so sure I'm going to do this because it's going to hurt my constituency. And I don't want, I don't want, I don't want businesses, especially now, they're not going to want businesses um, that, that are going to fail. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been mentioned a few times, you know, in the state of Virginia, something that's active right now. Um, if you haven't already and you're based in Virginia, please send an email to Governor Northam. Um, we have that available on the PCA site. I know that CRA is doing a petition, sign their petition, do both of those. But everyone's absolutely right. We see these issues percolate across government, local, state, federal, and even in some international things. Um, you know, we've been successful at the federal level fighting off uh, tax increases. That will be something that will come up every single Congress. It takes an army uh, to defeat those things. Um, towards the latter part of last year and early part of this year, we've been fighting, um, you know, a ban on events, on sponsorship, on promotional products, whereby you wouldn't be able to have a Rocky Patel branded uh, lighter or cutter, things like that. So um, it's getting granular. Uh, a lot of these groups that are, are against premium cigars or against tobacco in general are not, they're neglecting the data. In any of our meetings, we're citing FDA, NIH data uh, in order to present our case. Uh, so we really need to push back. Virginia right now is a real time threat where uh, we need everyone's support. So I, I think that, um, you know, I would ask Scott the, uh, you know, same question that, uh, you know, Rocky, how can the industry really come together um, as that tripod that you mentioned? So sorry, guys. I just lost my audio for about a minute and a half. No so worries. If you can quickly oh, you, you, you just you just missed Josh's brilliant idea. He's got the silver bullet. You missed it, Rocky. But rest <laughs> assured, it, it you you basically by by being silent, you agreed to be a blank check for us. So thank you. I'm I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, in terms of the industry coming together, I think that there's a, a lot of different ways in which we can do that. And to, to Rocky's point, right, we it, it is it does take everybody and we need to all be involved. Um, a couple of the ways in which that does really take effect is, number one, please connect with us at PCA. Uh, Josh, you talked about you being able to work with people and work through different compliance issues or some of these other things. I think another important piece is is that one of the reasons why we exist as an organization is to connect the industry. And if something happens in Washington, in Oregon, or in Idaho, if we know about that, the chances that that ends up happening in places like New Hampshire or Virginia or Georgia, we can then turn about and communicate that and help us develop responses, materials, templates, and things like that in order to respond I, I, to I that. Can, I can give you the three basic easy steps. The first Beautiful. thing you need to do, the first, well, obviously you got to be a PCA member, number one. Number two, join your local state association, all right? Number three, attend the trade show. And then after that, be involved. Check out the PCA website. Stay in touch with the association members. Find out what's going on. You know, you have uh, Rachel presently running the state associations, working with state associations for the PCA. You have Josh working on the federal side for you. So when there are federal issues, you can reach out to Josh. Josh will be reaching out to the states that are matter. So you can come up to Washington, D.C., come to the office, walk the halls, but just start, you know, walk before you run. If you can do the three basic things, which is join the PCA, secondly, join the state associations, and attend the trade show, that would be a hell of a start for 90% of the people. 
Okay, so let's start there. Once you can start there, there's enough tools that are provided to walk you through the next steps. Yeah, and just as you know, yourself and um, our board of directors came to Washington uh, in February of this year, you know, had 40 congressional meetings. That has to be a consistent basis. We need to grow the number of people. We have a retail store in every single congressional district, over 3,000 PCA members across the country um, that have influence. These are small business owners that can provide insight to members of Congress. So, you know, one of the things during the coronavirus, obviously, we're unable to be in Washington, D.C., uh, going from Capitol Hill visit to Capitol Hill visit as, as your lobbying team, but we are doing these phone conversations. Uh, Tyler Henson, one, one of our uh, state regional representatives, did a great job and set up something with Senator Cory Gardner. We can set up meetings with your individual members of Congress, your senators, it, reach out to us if you're interested in establishing that relationship. We have guides how to communicate with Congress, We'll do the scheduling. We'll do the legwork. We want to, at the end of the year, have hundreds of touch points with members of Congress so that we can build that infrastructure that's both on the offense and the defense. And a lot of it is on the defense. You know, the folks at CRA and, and Mike and uh, the, the, my predecessors at PCA have been defeating bad legislation for many years. And we're getting to the point where we're, we're seeing that volume of stuff increase and we're having to, you know, f fire at multiple different targets and we're advancing and also playing defense at the same time. But we need the support of your, your consumers, the retailers and manufacturers. And, and that's the only way that we're going to be successful in creating positive legislation that really helps support our industry, helps the 30,000 plus employees that are in the retail sector in showcasing, um, you know, the full volume of the premium cigar industry. And I think and the to... other thing that's happening here is, you know, aside from uh, advocacy, uh, I think that, uh, you know, what PCA is striving for is to help you improve your business. Uh, you know, I'm constantly searching to, to become a better business person. I, I, I learn from many of my competitors who, uh, who have skills that I don't possess. They're doing things differently than I do, possibly better than I do. And so I'm constantly earning uh, you know, to learn. And, 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 and now the PCA is absolutely providing you tools to become a better retailer. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Whether mm -hmm. it's point of sale, whether it's merchandising, it's marketing, I mean, you, you need to learn from doing events. I mean, uh, you know, you, you talk to a David Garofalo or Jeff Borshowitz, uh, 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 Abe. Um, you know, there, there's, there's so many great retailers out there. And, and, and you ought to learn what they do that makes them very, very successful. And, and you can learn everything from, like I said, from marketing to POS to merchandise to, to buying to, to a lot of things. So become a better retailer and learn and you can learn that not only at your state association level you can learn that uh by seminars you can learn that by attending the pca show so those are tools that are being provided that you need to take advantage of to become a better retailer and i think it's very important to take advantage of that and that's the future of the pca and if you want to be involved in a, in, in a leadership role that's available too they are looking for fresh talent they're looking for new talent uh, you know, it's not like it's a little click of a board of directors that's been around a long time. The The level of participation can be endless. So if you're really looking and you've got some great fundamental ideas and, and you're looking for things in new direction, uh, I'm sure that the, the, the PCA has an appetite for letting people like that get involved. So, you know, it's about getting involved. Don't think you're too far removed. Don't think you're too small. Don't think that you've never been involved and you don't know which direction to head. It starts by taking a few little steps. And once you take those steps and get involved, uh, you know, the world's your oyster. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And thank you. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's, that's hundred percent, uh, accurate in terms of our approach to trying to get more members involved as well as trying to build out a whole suite of services and being a full service organization. Um, to, to circle back real quick on, on what Josh was talking about there as far as the relationships and connecting with senators and, and congressmen and how that actually helps us 
Um, that that that's true on a state level as well. We have relationships with with state representatives and state senators. Uh, I just talked to one recently out in Colorado who's been a tremendous champion for us and who who carries our water for us. So when anything comes up in the uh, like Colorado state legislator. She's the one who's going forward and carrying our message forward and to the point because we have that relationship and and that then helps us. That way we don't always have to be the ones and, and that's so important. And so even at that local level, if if you have relationships or host potential uh, events with your local representatives and connect that with your business, with the community, as well as the community of uh, premium cigar and pipe enthusiasts and consumers that just gets them to, we all know once, once you get into this industry, you, you fall in love with it because of the people, because of the relationships and that will happen with your state representatives as well. And we break down those barriers. And so the more that it happens at the local level, the more that's going to translate to a national level and a federal level as well. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And there has to be an appetite for self-improvement, you know, um, in our yeah. industry, that's the one thing, you know, you, you see shows like Bar Rescue and stuff like that. I mean, you, are, you you see some of these shows and how people run their businesses and you just go, oh, my God, you know. Uh, so it's, it's hard when you're in the in the trees to see the forest. And that's very applicable in every business. Uh, you know, I run around through a lot of retail sh operations throughout the country. So I've seen quite a few of them. And, and so, you know, you should all kind of have that that appetite to really go out there and, and become better and see how you can do things better, uh, especially when you have to compete against, you know, the big mail order houses and stuff, you know, it's service oriented, it's uh, cleaner stores, uh, friendly service, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, all, it's those little things that matter. You know, if I were to open a pizzeria, yeah. I'd go right across the pizzeria that's successful and try and do things better than they're doing in all factors. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think this industry needs a wake up call. Uh, you know, if you really want to stay and you're proud to be in this industry and, and, and doing it because of the passion that you have for it, obviously you want to be successful. You know, we need to have a wake up call and really, yeah. re, re, it's, it's each person needs to participate. You know, I forget the, the famous words that Kennedy gave in his speech. Uh, somebody can remember that line, but uh, it's not what I do for your country. It's what, you know, <laughs> whatever that. So that's what I feel. I mean, I think every yeah. single person moving forward. Once we get through this difficult time, needs a wake up call and come to a self realization of what, how they can help make this a better industry for themselves and for the family together, all of us all in it together. You know, I would just like to say that I think that, that this pandemic has kind of been somewhat of that. And I, I got to be honest, I've, I've been so impressed with how so many retailers have, have been answering the call, figuring out ways to, to change up some business models to, to meet the demands and to keep their businesses going. And I think that, um, this 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 is a potential wake up call to say hey look moving forward there are some things that we can do uh, that will help kind of move our ball forward as far as what we define ourselves as as a, as a brick and mortar retailer uh, it doesn't even necessarily need to be strictly limited to curbside or delivery uh, but to to your further to your point as far as the service and and I've talked a lot about this over the past two weeks one of the special things that a retailer offers is a, a connection. And and particularly now, I think everyone is starved for that connection because we're all quarantined off. And so I think there's going to be a massive opportunity for what the retailers can provide and what we can provide as an industry as far as that. Because I think at the end of the day, what a cigar represents, at least to me and for, for so many that I've talked to, cigar represents a connection. It represents this this uh, fraternity, sorority, whatever you want to call it, family. I, you know, Rock, you are very big on that theme. Uh, but I do think that this is uh, going to be a potential launch pad for, for retailers. We just need to help get through this particular uh, uh, contraction. Uh, I guess that's someone I'm on the call for right now, but the, the pandemic that's causing this contraction. Well, so, Scott, I have a question for you. Obviously, you know, our phone's yeah. been ringing off the hook. Uh, people asking us, uh, what's the status of the trade show? I mean, what, what's the message? What's the official PCA message on that? Sure, absolutely. I've had a lot of questions of that too. Uh, right now, the show is on, and um, you know we're still ninety days out, and so things are changing constantly. And again, we talked about this a little bit earlier about the uncertainty that all of this is breeding throughout all industries, and that is one hundred percent accurate for for trade shows and for meetings and conferences. And so we are in constant contact with local authorities in Nevada. We are also in constant contact with Sands Venetian in terms of any changes and updates. As a, and we are right now we're moving forward 
the show is on right now, and uh, that's the way that we are operating. Obviously, we're doing things a little bit differently because of the way that's happened. I mean, traditionally, right now, things like the brochures and, and you know mass marketing as far as registrations and hotel reservations, things like that. While that's all open right now, um, really, ultimately, we're we're doing things a little bit differently because of that. But we are the, the trade show is a go uh, as it currently stands right now, and, and obviously, again with all of everybody's businesses that are out there, things are changing on a near daily basis. So we are continuing to monitor the same way that everybody else is. Uh, just to go back on your earlier point, um, Rocky, I think the best practices and, and retailers, the peer to peer learning, everything up and, you know, perfecting their craft. I think that that has been something that has been really eye or us at PCA in creating, you know, these digital channels. We would do public engagement series, have a ton of people at the townhouse. We're now doing more of these focused ones. You know, we had, we started the week off with Ace Prime and Crown Heads. Yesterday we had Greg Zimmerman talking about some of the things that he's doing to adapt his business and resources that are available uh, in, in, in getting government to assist, you know, with the SBA programs, treasury programs. Today we're, you know, honored to be able to speak with you. And then <clears throat> tomorrow uh, we have uh, Scott and Glenn Luke kind of tied to the whole. Next Thursday, I'll be on with Alan Rubin and talking what they're doing at Alec Bradley. So, you know, we're growing our portfolio of communications tools. I think that one of the greatest assets that we have in, as an association, and it's a testament to Scott's leadership, is the magazine, um, you know, coming up with interesting ideas and best practices, you know, what are the bookstores doing? What are other retail organizations doing? And seeing how we can adapt some of those tips and tricks and trends. And, you know, no, no idea is, you know, so far flung. I remember one of the articles that, that I wrote for the um, magazine itself was, uh, I was in Tampa and purchased uh, at King Corona, a Rocky Patel lighter. And as I was going to get on my flight, TSA confiscated that, that lighter. And I had to, you know, put it through a, a system and have it. And as a result of that, uh, Patrick Anderson, one of the, the folks that works on our federal lobbying team, and I went and met with uh, the Department of Homeland Security and TSA and put together a guide of what you can and cannot bring on an airplane as a cigar enthusiast. So example of something that just popped up, um, you know, you mentioned kid show pickup, Scott. Tyler, I know, is working on an article right now on best practices for curbside pickup. So I think we're moving as an association a lot quicker. We're doing it through different communications tools that we haven't done in the past. Uh, and it's really exciting and informative to the vast amounts of, of people that are viewing this and different audience types. So, you know, whether you're watching this because you're a congressional staffer or just an average consumer or a PCA member, there's things that can, can be taken from this conversation uh, for all of the audiences that utilize PCA uh, and, and our, our partners and our advisory board uh, manufacturers you can learn something from all of that. Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick little break here. I, there was a comment that came up here. I just wanted to show this real quick. Uh, Mata was just saying that her grandmother today, uh, the grandmother is turning 109. So we just want to wish a happy birthday to Mata's <laughs> grandmother. She's turned 109. We, we have a lot of different uh, comments coming in. I, I see in the, the chat there. And, um, you know, Rocky, I'm smoking a, uh, ALR right now, Robusto. Can you tell us a little bit about that cigar and then the cigar that you're smoking? Sure. Uh, the ALR is actually an acronym for age limited and rare. Uh, you know, we've uh, recently in the last several years had the liberty to start taking some aged tobaccos. We've been expanding our farms in Nicaragua. We've got farms in Esteli and Condega. We brought another big farm in Nicaragua. And, you know, we've been uh, collecting a, a, a larger inventory of aged tobaccos. And, and the liberty and the plan moving forward was to take these tobaccos, make cigars, make some great blends, and put them away for 18 months to two years. Um, we increased a bit. We built a humidor uh, that stores a million and a half cigars uh, and and simply keep that humidor under lock and key 
And so uh, the concept behind the age limit and rare was to make a thousand boxes of each size and, and, and store the cigars and age them for two years and release them, uh, which we did at uh, uh, the initial one was two years ago. one and the ALR2 was released last year at the trade show in Vegas. And, uh, you know, I think it's become one of my new favorites. Uh, we don't have any boxes left anymore at, at our warehouse. Uh, we'll be re-releasing uh, that cigar again at the trade show. Hopefully, if there's a trade show this year in Vegas, and it's a medium to full, lots of notes of caramel, coffee, espresso. Mm -hmm. it, it's rich, complex, a very balanced cigar. And then I'm smoking the new TAA release. Uh, this is a cigar that was supposed to be released at the TAA convention. Um, which is a select group of about 70 retailers that attend this convention. This year was supposed to be in Cabo San Lucas, uh, but because of the virus, it was uh, uh, canceled. Uh, but this is a cigar that's uh, one size only in a Toro size, a uh, thousand boxes only to be made, and you'll find them at your local TEA retail stores uh, coming soon. Fantastic. Those are exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying that one. I'm enjoying the ALR. And like you said, with the coffee nodes, I, I, uh, I always have it with an espresso or, um, you know, just a regular black cup of coffee. I, I had a, a chat similar to this with Steve Zangle from Los Cayetos last week. And uh, I'm in Erie, Pennsylvania here, in my hometown. And we have the Tim Hortons coffee. Uh, which is a Canadian company, and that's always a really good pairing with your your fine cigars. By the way, I've been working on some recipes for some tacos. As I know you are a partner in a taco <laughs> restaurant. I have a couple of killer recipes that are going to blow you away. Blow you away. I've got one for street tacos, and I've got one for the American tacos, and they're, 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 they'll knock your socks off. They're, they're, they're very good. I'm looking forward to when this is all over and we can host you for some tequila and tacos at, at Taco Rock. So yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. I've been <laughs> Rocky. Nuts. Rocky doesn't drink I've been tequila like crazy, but nobody to feed. So I've been just taking <laughs> food and, uh, and feeding Nimish and Nish and Dave Bullock and everybody at the office. Uh, other than nice. that, you know, cook, keep cooking up a storm. Uh, today, I think this morning I started with some uh, uh, shumai. Uh, dumplings, and then I made some pork and shrimp dumplings, uh, and then I'm doing a whole Korean barbecue theme uh, that I'm working on. Yesterday was Persian cuisine with all kinds of kebabs and stuff, and uh, so yeah, just experimenting, trying stuff. It's been fun, but uh, it's uh, it's challenging. It's challenging. I hope we come out of this sooner than later. Absolutely. Quick, quick, quick favor, Rocky. Um, can I just mark this down? on whatever agenda or calendar you have. The next time we're quarantined, can you be my quarantine buddy so that that way all this food you're cooking, I can avail myself as well, as well as your cigars. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And trust me, this would be a good house to be quarantined in. <laughs> decent supply of cigars, food, and a little bit of wine. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Not necessarily in that order though. Not, no, no, not in that order. Well, Rocky, we're coming up on the hour. We appreciate your time. Um, Scott, do we have any um, questions that were submitted by people that have been watching the broadcast? Well, let's see. We've got the correct quote here. It's not what your country can do. For, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? So that's not what, you know, cigar industry can do for you, but what you can do for the cigar industry. So, uh, and then uh, one thing Shorty brought up here is put this up. We got the Cigar Association of Virginia. So anybody that is in the Virginia, state of Virginia, uh, that's a great association, very active, very effective. Uh, get involved with ASAP so that we can kill that 100% tax increase. Um, um, but some, you know, some good uh, I mean, that's comments. That's a perfect example, Scott. Exactly. So exactly. Virginia is a perfect example. You got so many retail stores. Uh, you have Shorty. You have Scott. You've got about three, four people literally fighting the battle, and they've been fighting it for years. This is not the first time. Okay, this has happened over the. Uh, over I know at least for at least five, six years in Virginia. And these people protect your rights. Not only do they put in the money and the time, but they protect your rights so that you have these things because, and you don't have these other issues. And so if you were to get involved, this wouldn't happen as often, and you wouldn't have to rely on two or three people. There's no reason you don't have 25 to 30 people in that association helping fight this battle because it can significantly impact your life and your business. You know, with a hundred percent increase, and the, these type of ballots keep coming up. There's, you know, it, it just takes one person from tobacco-free kids or, or American Cancer Society lobby a certain 
state legislative person to, to introduce a bill and they do and then these things catch fire and take off because there's no opposition yeah yeah and just to underscore tyler's point here is one of our great uh regional representatives that works on our state issues um yeah please go to the pca website to get a contact for regional government affairs representatives and, and ways to get involved in in what we do there um, I, uh, I think i think you got some guests that are ringing doorbells rocky i think people might have heard you're cooking and they're coming over no, here it's not over here i was I, I don't know what that was I, I i know josh is probably in london or something sounds like big ben <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, well, we really appreciate your time and insights, Rocky. Uh, we'll post this uh, across our channels for the folks that weren't able to watch this live. But again, please go to our website, premiumcigars.org. Go to the Cigar Rights of America website. Uh, support your associations, uh, your uh, state associations, as we pointed out. And uh, I'll tell you what, I've really enjoyed the ALR. Give it a try. My first cigar was a Rocky Patel cigar. I was in college and it was on a cruise. It was a class, believe it or not, at Washington and Jefferson College. My favorite professor, uh, Dr. Joe DeSaro, who I believe is watching this, uh, got, got me a cigar when we were on a cruise. And, uh, you know, that was, that was my first uh, cigar. So I, I really uh, appreciate it. And it's an honor to uh, be able to speak with you and work with you on the government relations side of things where, where we fight every day. Thank you. Thank you. And I just got a note from Glenn Loop saying that uh, Governor Como in New York is trying to raise yep. the OTP to 75 percent. So you see, yep. I mean, th th this is already starting. You know, the guy can't buy ventilators when they're available, but certainly he wants to, you know, just because he doesn't smoke a cigar, he's going to take your right away to enjoy a cigar. Th that's how ridiculous this gets. And that's why we got to be active and involved. Yep. And we'll hear more from Glenn uh, tomorrow uh, with a special broadcast with Scott. And then, like I said, next week, next Thursday, another uh, great champion for our industry will be live with Alan Rubin of Alec Bradley. But thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy some fine cigars. Thank you. And stay, stay healthy. Safe. Stay safe. You too. Thanks. Take care, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.